going to talk about rolling friction. Rolling friction is a simple example of what you can do with the equations of equilibrium. The general thing that you need to remember here is that rolling friction is separate and quite different from sliding friction. You can have something sliding along or rolling along, but it's not going to be both. It's kind of like tipping. It's another, another choice. So if you have a wheel that's going like this and it's rolling along with no friction at all, there is no horizontal force here. I mean, the sum of the forces on this wheel is zero. So there's no friction. But we know, of course, in the real world that a wheel rolling like this will slow down. So there has to be some sort of P making it keep going. As soon as you have this, now your sum of the forces in Y tells you that W equals N. Sum of the forces in X tells you that P has to equal some sort of horizontal reaction force, friction. So there has to be this sort of F. Now, the other thing that you need to keep knowing, knowing is that to balance the moments, this normal force can't act right under the weight. This is the same as when we had a crate sitting on a surface like this. And the moment that is caused by P tending to turn this way has to be balanced by the normal force tending to turn this way about the point under the weight. So we're going to actually slide this normal force that way by some distance. We're going to call that distance B. That's the coefficient of rolling resistance. So the general principle here is to keep the wheel rolling, you're going to need a P. To balance the P, the surface must apply some sort of friction force F, as well as some sort of normal force N to balance the weight. To balance the moments, N has to move to the right by some distance, which we're going to call B. So the sum of the forces, if I take it right here where the normal force is applied, by some of those moments, what I end up with is the weight times this perpendicular distance has to be balanced by this P times the perpendicular, its perpendicular distance, which is the radius of the wheel. So here I have W times B equals P times the radius of the wheel. Now, we call this B the coefficient of rolling resistance. It's kind of funny coefficient because it actually has units of length. So it's not a unitless coefficient. This is actually units of length. Now, there are some people who like to say, I'm going to call the coefficient of rolling resistance actually B divided by RW the radius of the wheel, so that you have a non-dimensional coefficient. So if you're going to look these up in the table, make sure you understand what you're getting, whether you're actually getting B or B divided by RW. So what do these numbers actually look like? If you're talking about a railroad car, so here's my railroad car, I'm going to have N, NW number of wheels. So on a railroad car, you might have eight wheels. If it's a steel wheel and it's a steel rail, you're talking about a B that's on the radius on the order of 0 0.001 times the radius of the wheel. So these are very tiny friction, rolling friction. Car tires on asphalt end up being 10 times that, 0 0.03. Car tire on loose sand, it takes, again, 10 times more power to keep the car rolling on loose sand than it does for these other two cases. So here's our free body diagram for each wheel, I will have W over the number of wheels. I will have P over the number of wheels. That's, this is the amount of power, amount of gas, amount of go juice that you need to have this wheel keep going once it's churning. My reaction force down here, R, now I just took N and W and added it up to get a single force, R, that acts at some angle, theta. We know now, remember, that that theta will be phi S when slipping occurs. So at my axis B, here are my equations of equilibrium. The sum of the forces in X, this is going to be my friction force. The sum of the forces in Y, my weight is balanced by the normal force. And then the sum of the moments at some point, I took it about point Q, gives me about the same thing as I had before. Please don't memorize these formulas. What you need to do is draw your free body diagrams and actually go with it from there. If you want to put some of these numbers into a case like this, if you took a 100-ton railroad car, it takes 300 pounds of force if you're talking about a B like this. Once it starts going and it's rolling and it's at a steady state rolling condition, it's going to take 300 pounds to keep it going to overcome rolling resistance. This is different than like a 2-ton automobile, 4,000-pound car. 4,000-pound car might take 120 pounds to keep the car going. Now, that doesn't actually move nearly as much stuff as the 100-ton railroad car, which is why we use railroads. 
it's important to sort of notice that this, there are two other things we can talk about here with rolling resistance. One is that if you have a wheel that's rolling down the hill, sometimes this vertical force and the horizontal force are both components of the weight. So if you have a, a wheel rolling down a slope, you'll have a component of the weight that's acting along the slope and one that's acting perpendicular to the slope. Same picture, just tilted. And the other thing you need to realize about rolling resistance is that it comes from the general squishiness of your surface. So if you have something sitting on a surface, no surface is rigid. Nothing is rigid. <laughs> Crash. Nothing is rigid. So what you end up with is the notion that it, as you're going, you're actually deforming the surface and you're creating a ridge of material that you have to overcome. And that's where that rolling resistance comes from. Thanks.